want to introduce to you Dr. Anantha Babley. He is a professor of communications and media at Texas A&M Corpus Christi. But you got to understand, we go a long way back, don't we, Dr. Babley? <laughs> yes. And it's, yes, absolutely. It's so interesting More than because two decades. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Oh goodness, if we count. You know, I was at homecoming this year. Uh-huh. And I estimated it was between 26 and 27 years that I walked out on the 50-yard line in the homecoming court. So oh it's, it's getting close to 30 years, Dr. Badley. Oh, my God. How oh, time flies, yes. I tell you. And y'all, look, he asked me to call him Anantha. I can't even bring myself to do it. He <laughs> says, I'm old enough and I've earned it. But you know what? This is Dr. B. It will always be Dr. B to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, whichever, whatever makes you feel comfortable, Michelle, but you have earned it. Though. Oh, you, you are can awesome. call me. Well, listen, what do you think we have a culture soup moment? Oh, oh my goodness. The, the things that are going on in the world today. Yes. Just an astonishing array of events and such a diverse interpretations of reality in the world today is just, you know, it's getting us so into, crazy. you know, so the I'm going to ask you about these things. A yes. yes. moment, I comb the threads and I see what everybody's talking about. And it, you cannot avoid hashtag coronavirus or hashtag COVID-19. And yes. that's the disease that started in China that's been contained. But uh, now it's in the United States. We have the NBA canceling the entire season. I know. We have NCAA saying no fans at March Madness. They're taking the madness at a March. <laughs> I know. What is happening? It's, okay, just imagine the ripple effects of globalization. Yeah. You know, we always talked about globalization in a very positive terms, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that, you know, largely it is true. But we never expected this pandemic globalization which sweeps you know every country and we're not immune to you know uh, no country is immune to no culture is immune to this it's very scary and you know i have on my tcu shirt and we'll talk about our connection to tcu but i received phone call recorded messages text messages emails from the school we're extending spring break we're on spring break now Next oh week, God. we're going to be on spring break, too. They're telling all the students to stay home. Oh the my. ones that are already at home, the ones that are there, they have to stay there. Can't go anywhere. Good. we're going to online classes on the 23rd when we, quote, unquote, virtually return. Oh, my goodness. Until the 3rd of April. That is so amazing. One of the yeah. first universities to make that kind of move. I'm yeah. sure others will follow. But... Talk to me. I mean, first of all, explain what globalism means. I know because I attended your class back in 1989. (laughs) But for everybody else that's out there that may not know, define globalism. You know, the the idea of globalization or globalism is basically that, that things travel internationally uh, across boundaries of cultural boundaries too, literally on a uh, everyday basis, yeah. and and whatever happens in one country will surely have an impact in many many other countries. So the definition is international is also intercultural, and uh, and the way uh, these days is that there's so much of ethnic diversity in in every country that international is not necessarily across the boundaries Mm -hmm. but it is also internal Mm -hmm. um, in one country because it is so intercultural that uh, that particular discourse happens literally on on you know literally every second and every hour and every day you know so that's the macro definition of of globalization or globalism and most of the time we interpreted it as economic globalism you know right. where you know trade dominates it and uh, business uh, you know uh, transfer of goods and mm-hmm. services you know but these days though because of the high tech 
communications right. that we are literally saturated you know and ev- it is not just economic globalization you know it's cultural and it is um, political and also more importantly now even diseases yes. the human condition that travels across boundaries immediately well yeah. and let's think about this now that we have this air travel that is something that everybody seems to do it mm-hmm. is inexpensive the common man or woman can board a flight and they yep. can go anywhere in the world and exactly. you know one of the first financial engines is having a difficult time right now is the travel industry airlines yeah. hotels I mean, Joni and I were supposed to go to Disney World next week. We are not oh, going. No. We'll put it off, but until when? I know, I know. You know, air travel is, is like a bus travel now. You yeah. know, it's like a train travel. You know, it's so convenient and so, you know, so inexpensive. And um, it's, it's not just for domestic purposes. You know, the, the even the business enterprise mm-hmm. has begun to rely so much on air transportation and look at Amazon. Yeah. You know, it's not just the people moving, but it's also goods. goods. The way they sh- they are shipped around the world instantaneously, just massive explosion, exponential yeah. explosion of of how things happen these well, days. Well, and it's interesting because our <clears throat> I call him Forty Five. I don't really name him on this show, but he spoke last night, and a lot of people were disappointed in what he had to say because he said. You know what? This is just a moment in time. It's not a financial thing. What? Okay. (laughs) (laughs) This is a major financial thing. I know. Um, I know. And and the the impact, you know, one sphere of human life has on all other spheres of life, you know? and, And countries, by and large... Uh, are inexperienced with handling pandemic diseases. Mm-hmm. I mean, they 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 don't have a, a firmly set crisis communication plan for the for the entire country, uh, and you know, nationally, um, that any political entity should have a crisis communication plan ready. You know, uh, and and that strategy, even in advanced countries, from Europe to United States to Japan. And Russia, we they're not equipped to to really deal with a major pandemic crisis right. like we have today. So we see Italy closing its borders. They're on yeah. lockdown. However, exactly. you do that, <laughs> how exactly. many millions and millions of people can't go anywhere outside of Italy? And now we have 45 saying we are banning travel to Europe. To- I know, I know. I had a friend in Iceland just last week, and I was texting her friend, tickly saying, "Are you back? Get back before you get stuck." I know. I have friends I know. getting on a cruise ship, trying to stop them. They won't listen. No. No. Just but- imagine the unfathomable scenario: something happens in Wuhan, China, yeah. and NBA or our athletic events yes. shut down. I mean, what, what, the, the look at the global connection, you it's, know? It's and, amazing. Oh, absolutely. And How? the advertisers, this is the thing. Okay, I was explaining this to my, my little girl who's seven and she gets uh-huh. it. Uh-huh. I said, you know, 45 just jacked up the, the economy. It, it just, just janked it with this by having a slow response and not yes. taking it seriously. So now, look at the NBA. Yeah. They shut down the entire se- season. Let's think I, about all the vendors in the arenas that don't get work. Let's yeah. think about the ticket sales that do not happen because the bodies will not be in seats or yeah. they're getting refunded. Let's think yeah. about the advertisers that pay for all that space on television. Absolutely. And beyond, out of home, whatever you're doing, that's yeah. money. Absolutely. And the massive repercussions of that, you know, it's rippled literally into every sphere of life. Look at the medical establishment now, the scientific, you know, field which which uh, discovers and invents mm-hmm. cures for human diseases. You know, yeah. they are so hard pressed now, literally, you know, science doesn't occur in a vacuum. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's, it, it draws from the society and... Um, and instantaneously, they have to react, mm-hmm. you know, in a, in a crisis mode. It really, uh, 
pressures the entire industry uh, you know the hospitals and, and you know the 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 response medical response to this right. and no country you know uh, we are looking at the united states but look at every other country it it is going through a real crisis yeah. movement and we have to be very cautious of how it impacts on society because yes. xenophobia for example or the, the fear of the unknown mm-hmm. um those kind of things uh, have to be really watched you know yeah. and a country has to take precautions uh, to avoid those kind of uh, stages you know which 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 and uh, you know this kind of crisis ends up in you know well and let's talk about the very thing that brought us together and that's media Yeah. Media's yeah. role in all of this is so crucial. And yes. words matter and pictures matter. You taught me that. I so, know. one of the first things that I heard, just little little tidbits here and there on any of the the cable newscasts, right? Yeah. They were calling yeah. this disease exotic. Um, and that that had underpinnings of wait, what? Just I because know. it came from China, we're going to call it what? And it also distanced us, don't you think, from yeah. it because if it's exotic, it's that thing over there. I know, I know. And that that that's that's one of the things that media has to watch and it is self self-correcting process. Yeah, I mean they do correct themselves eventually. But you know, you cannot sensationalize, you cannot dramatize uh diseases like this. I mean because the the society is dependent on the media for credible information without sensationalism mm-hmm. you know we have seen that throughout history yeah. you know the the black plague uh, to you know how certain ethnicity um you know uh, has been single singled out you know for a cause and 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 things like that really have dangerous effects i mean india for example mm-hmm. you know went through polio went through smallpox went through uh, cholera chickenpox you know um and which reminds us of the bubonic plague of europe i mean how uh and how things happen in so fast that you know if, if the governments have to be so cautious and so self aware of the dangers that lurk behind these developments you know and media has to play a very central role in stabilizing and and, and in kind of reassuring you know their uh, audiences that you know this is not time to panic this is not time to politicize and don't don't think about politics this is the human condition right that we have to respond to and, and let's be very cautious about that and if the media doesn't take that sort of a leadership right right we are in really really bad shape look at italy the mm-hmm. italian journalists are, are telling us that that uh, you know coronavirus has actually cannibalized Uh, the rest of the journalistic enterprise wow. because they do not have time to cover any other event that that mm-hmm. could be significantly impacting on us mm-hmm. and they do not have time to interpret uh, mm-hmm. for their citizens in such a way that citizens actually understand the significance of this disease yeah, yeah. and how it spreads and you know what do you mean by social dis- distancing w- what exactly is that i mean everybody has one image of uh, a different image of what social distancing is you know right. so you right. need to be uh, the media has to educate its, its audiences its you know its, its customers and to be specific to be very clear and this is an educational enterprise actually media has to take on that role of being an educator now mm-hmm. well you know what all of what you're saying is taking me back <laughs> to the year 1989 yeah. where at TCU i entered with about 199 other students <laughs> a lecture <laughs> hall at Sid Richardson and there you were down because yep. it was an amphitheater type style yeah, lecture exactly. hall where we you know theater style we'd sit there and we were kind of looking down at you right because we yeah, the, yeah. this the, exactly. this chairs went up the yeah, seats went up yeah. and the there you were stadium. and yeah. you would ask us a current event question right off the top in the mass yeah. communications freshman class and yeah. you challenged us to know what was going on in the world I know. Yeah. And how important that is. You know what Dr. Babley, I took that from you. I do that with my students now. 
Wow. And they literally <laughs> thank me. And it's a writing and editing class in strategic yeah. communications. And they're like, you know what? This gives us a reason to really pay attention. Because yeah. they don't, which is scary. I know with all the social media sources, with all the, you know, they're inundated with information, yet they don't know the headlines of the day, you know, and how can they live, I mean, in a way, day-to-day -day life without drawing from what's happening around, you know, yes. in the, from the surrounding, you know, areas that, that they are living in. And that's what I tell the students, that you cannot live in a vacuum. Right. You know, uh, you cannot live in a world of social media that is so clearly and, and, and narrow casted to define your existence. You know, there is a world out there. There mm -hmm. is a community out there we live in, you know, and well, they have to be connected to that. You make a really good point about narrow casting. And that's one of the things that social media allows us to do that's pretty negative. Build yeah. our very own yeah. echo chambers where we yeah. can shut right. out the things that we don't want to hear. And for so many... It's news. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, the news bubble that we talk about, you know, we live in a news bubble that we have defined it for ourselves. You know, the type of bubble we live in, mm -hmm. you know, it has to fit our viewpoints. It has to fit our perspectives, you know, our own ideological bias, you know, that, that, that kind of a bubble will simply self-contain mm -hmm. uh, a citizen uh, to live in that bubble. And that's absolutely, it's so unhealthy for a democracy because right. you shut out all other viewpoints and all other definitions of reality, you know? Yeah. Uh, and that's that's the danger in, in, uh, in how media and individuals react, you know, it connect. It is dangerous. So, well, I was fortunate to not just have you in that freshman class. And by the way, that's where I learned to study because yeah. you would come in and you would lecture and you were so fascinating and you would get a discussion going and y'all I'm about to date myself because I likened it to Donahue now some of you out there have, don't even know who that is <laughs> but he had a talk show that pretty much Oprah patterned her show after exactly. and it was a lively talk show so yeah. Dr. Babley would literally ask us for our informed point of views yeah, and yeah. students would stand up and they would give them and okay a debate would always ensue yeah and it was exactly. wonderful but the thing was we weren't reading like we needed to the first semester <laughs> <laughs> so know. when that midterm came man we all tanked the midterm but we learned <laughs> and you told us I told you to read the text. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, you still remember in detail. My yes. God, I can't forget that. I mean, at eighteen, you're you're pretty impressionable. It it matters what happens when you're that age, and yes. it's one of the reasons why I've kept a connection to all sorts of universities, UNT, yeah. TCU. HBCUs yeah. like Howard and Lane College. I'm always uh -huh. speaking because I believe that that is a pivotal point for Absolutely. people to make up their minds about things. I know. To I open know. their minds and learn things. And so Dude. they can see someone like me. Even if they are not like me, they need to see somebody like me. Yeah. And, yeah. and share different points of views in a safe environment. Yeah. Absolutely. And this uh, is how I, I'm actually feeding the pipeline of rock star leaders, you know, yeah, as an executive yeah. coach. Um, but Dr. Babley, look, you stuck with me. And I tell this story on the TCU Lead On campaign where they actually came to my home, went to my job, and shot okay. a video. It's still on the website. Wow. TCU, um, what is it? T Leadon.tcu.edu. That's where you I can see. go. And you okay. can see it. But I tell the story of a professor that put about four of us in the backseat of his car once a month and took <laughs> us to the Fort Worth Star-Telegram to meet with what was then the Dallas-Fort Worth Association of Black Communicators, yes. which would be the Dallas chapter of the National Association of Black Journalists. At uh, 18, I became a member. Oh, my. Thanks yeah. to you. And that's where I met John McKay, who just retired, you, the anchor here in Dallas. I met uh, Cheryl Smith, who is still, um, she's a publisher here mm -hmm. locally for the black press. I yeah. met all sorts of people that I grew up with. Roland Martin. <laughs> I mean, we all yeah. know who he is, right? I remember and that. then beyond Dallas, this network of black journalists 
all in mainstream and black journalism. Yep. And it has defined my career like you would not believe. Wow. Even as a PR professional, I... my mm-hmm. first line of business was media relations. Yeah. I knew everybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I know. I know. But I got my yeah. first job in, in television news as an uh-huh. intern because you introduced me to Janet Johnson, who yeah. worked for the Weather Channel for a long time. And she's in yeah. Atlanta right now, still in contact with her. Still wow. consider her to be a mentor. And you know, Alfred Charles, you remember? Yes, Alfred. Alfred. <laughs> Alfred's still one of my best friends. Oh, my. He's goodness. doing great. And I believe he's in California right now. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, in wow. digital media. Still doing what he does. Okay. Very good at it. He's been all oh. over the place. But mm. Alfred was the editor of The Skiff. And for oh. anybody that doesn't know, that's the campus newspaper. Yes, yes. You remember exactly. my column? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> yeah. Caused a little bit of a stir. Oh, my. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. you know, I, I want to bring this up because ultimately, ultimately my master's thesis, which mm-hmm. I've shared on my, my social uh, community, often yes. I've shown them the spine. In fact, I, I have it right here. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> here it is. There you go. Oh, my. <laughs> yes. I, you know, I have a copy of that in my office. So... I have a copy I, of that in my office. You do? You still yes. do? Oh my yes. gosh! Y'all, this is my first published work. Um, it's in a library somewhere in Connecticut or something. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. It's also uh, in the TCU library. Has, yeah, in the archives. Yes, they have in the archives. I whipped it out, Dr. Babbley, just recently, in the last three years, because I had the amazing opportunity to meet and work with Dr. Henry Louis Gates, who I quote. Oh, wow. really? Yes. Oh, he's a friend wow. now. <laughs> yeah. And he's invited me to his classroom, and I'll go and, and, and at some point, you know, when he's teaching, I think he teaches in the fall, and sit yeah. at Harvard and listen to him. I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's huge. Oh, my goodness. But this, this, everybody, my master's thesis, Dr. Babley was my thesis chairperson. And when you get your master's degree, you have somebody that kind of ushers you through the process of research and writing and they make sure that you get it just right before you go and defend it in front of these scholars who sit up there and don't smile (laughs) (laughs) that's right (laughs) but this is my first work in diversity and inclusion before people called it that yeah that's right that's right and you had everything to do with this. Uh, my value proposition centers around tech, culture, and business. Yes. And to this day, I talk about a list that I wrote of six things that I wanted to do when I had the credibility, the experience, the network. And mm-hmm. I'm doing them all right now, Dr. Babley. Oh, Michelle, I'm so proud of you. I'm proud of you. I mean, my I- goodness. You know, and the journey you took and some of the top echelons of our American industry and, you know, you rose up to executive level appointments and, uh, you know, this is this is a a testament to your um, sense of uh, social commitment, you know, and and the social responsibility that you felt on on your shoulders from early, early on, you exhibited that. That, you know, the sense of commitment to society yeah. larger than us, you know. I talk to professionals about how there are keys to your future and your past. Yeah. And you have to yeah. own your story. And yeah. so That's when I look I mean. back and I think about that column at the skiff. And yeah. I, you know, yeah. it was just an eight to write yeah. about things and topics on racial equality. When I, I was on a campus with 3% black people. Just yeah. three. <laughs> just three and the international students even less right yeah latina yeah. students even less asian right. students even less <laughs> so mind you throwing that into that environment at that yeah. point and we were in the mid 90s um early 90s yeah um it was shocking to a lot of students absolutely absolutely and and the way we exhibited that diversity you know uh it was a learning tool for everybody on campus yeah. and you challenged them 
to uh, examine uh, their own viewpoints and perspectives you know before they decided on the legitimacy of those perspectives yeah. and uh, you know you, you really uh, contributed phenomenally to TCU you know well, and I appreciate that I tell you something, there's a little legal thing going on at TC right now that I can't really talk about, but if oh, you really? look at the legal brief, uh -huh. they actually pulled at least three of my articles from the skiff. Oh my. I know. So of course as faculty, I'm like, okay, I'm out of it, right? But on the <laughs> other hand, I'm like, if I can help this young woman, yeah. Oh. how many years later, my words oh. still matter? Yeah. Oh my goodness. I mean, that was one that made me like sit down and think and shed a tear. Oh my God. See that those are the lasting contributions. Yes. Michelle. Before the internet, when you could just mm -hmm. Google it and find it, like they literally had to go to the library and pull like probably microfilm. <laughs> uh, I tell you, you know, that is, you know, and these days the challenges for, you know, uh, diversity in the media uh, are much more complex because, yeah. you know, we tend to think that social media and the reach of electronic media, you know, is so extensive now, but, but, but that's, that's deceiving, you know, yeah. in a way that we have not had um, any increase in in the in the uh, number of uh, you know diverse journalists or, or media professionals and the perspectives you know uh, are in the public sphere so called mm -hmm. you know are still uh, limited you know yeah. so well I'm not the only one that recognizes the heft and the absolute fantastic awesomeness of Dr. Babley I call him my beyond mentor you know as I build my personal board of directors over the years he's a part of my tribe but you're a carnegie tell me what that is yeah the carnegie foundation yes. texas professor of the year when i was at tcu you know uh and for, uh, that was for the first time a media uh academician you know a professor wow. ever got that award so i was my i was surprised myself but <laughs> <laughs> you know, so uh, it was it was reserved for more of us, you know, science professors or mathematics, yeah. you know, but never for journalism and media studies uh, uh, professor, you know. That's amazing. So that was the first time. Uh, so got... proud of you. And you're at A&M Corpus Christi. And what are you teaching there? Well, I'm right now uh, global media and international communication, First Amendment studies. Oh, wow. uh, you know, and ethics of communication um, and media and society and global leadership too, international leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, we we are at this geographic uh, location in Corpus mm -hmm. Christi, you know. Um, the border is not too far from here right. to Mexico and the entire Central and South America. And there's an incredible uh, cultural mm -hmm. Um, vibrancy in this area, you know. Yeah. So, uh, and and in a way, that's a good mix for me. Uh, a lot of Hispanic um, Americans mm -hmm. uh, and uh, international students, and you know, uh, quite a diversity uh, mm -hmm. in this region. So, that is kind of uh, my my commitment is to address that diversity, draw the best from that diversity. You know, and and make it useful in the classroom, so that as professionals, our students will benefit later on right. from exposure. You know, that's amazing. You have poured into so many. You probably don't even know how many. <laughs> I mean, there were two hundred people in my class alone when I was I, a freshman. Yes, and that was just my freshman <laughs> class. Yeah. If you think about all the graduate students and undergraduate students. The lives that you've poured into, Dr. Babley. Thank you. That's awesome. Well, thank you. You know, in fact, I roughly counted at TCU yeah. because of the large classes I taught. Mm -hmm. You know, there were, there were about fourteen thousand students who went <gasps> through my classrooms. And any, you know, though during the years, the years I was there, fourteen thousand students went through my classes. And most of them are killing it. <laughs> oh. And the alumni, you know, TCU alumni still yes. keep in touch with me. A lot of them, you of know, of course they do. Drop me a line, you know, and say how much they appreciated something that I did in the classroom, which that, you know, it impacted on their professional lives and yeah. personal lives. Yeah. You know, so. It's meaningful. Uh, 
it's meaningful. I was at PMG Digital Agency. It's a worldwide agency there in Fort Worth to speak to what they call their We Collective. It's a group that champions equality. It's uh-huh. a kind of an employee resource group type thing. And as I'm speaking, I notice a young woman, she's kind of smiling. And I'm like, okay, well, she, she really likes what I'm saying. After it's over, she eased up to me and said, you may not remember me, but you guest lectured in Dr. Ashley English's classroom in cases, PR cases, oh, last good. year. And I just want to let you know, I never forgot it. And I love what you're doing. Please keep doing what you're doing. That See, stuff just messes me up. <laughs> that's the impact yes. teaching has on, on in society. You know, absolutely. Yeah. And it doesn't matter who they are, what their yeah. ethnic background. It does not matter. I know. It's that all God's is, children and it's beautiful. Yes, absolutely. You know, so we have to catch up, Michelle. We got to. We got to. Next time you're in Dallas. And oh, yes. a little trivia trivia uh, fact real quick. Uh-huh. When I started my agency back in 2002, 2003, I brought on a bunch of millennials and they were young millennials. Then now oh, they're, you know, they're all getting married, you know, knocking on the door of the C-suite. You know, they got their own yeah. families and all. But among the hires, I hired Dr. Babley's daughter. Yes. Laura Babley, who Love. is amazing. <laughs> I know. She's still at Cisco, right? Uh, yes, yes. She so, she went to IBM for a while. Okay. And she enjoyed it there. Yeah. And I think she's making a transition back to Cisco. Okay. Well, she is a social media maven. And during that time is when social media blossomed, 2007, 2008. Remember what we're exactly. talking about? Exactly. And yeah. so our little agency had a leg up. Well, at least it yep. was even with the big agencies because they didn't know what to do with the stuff either. <laughs> yeah. So we learned it. And every last one of the young yeah. people that were in my office right then are thriving as oh, social wow. media and digital and um, event and experience yeah. professionals at American Express. You know, and wow. I can just name them. Like, I know. I'm like, these are my kids. I love it. <laughs> God, that's amazing, Michelle. Yeah. You know? So it's, tell her I said, hey. I will. I yeah. sure will. What do you, you have know? coming up? you have any projects you're working on? You're <clears throat> speaking anywhere? Oh. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so uh, I'm actually concentrating on how, how the, the global governance of the Internet mm-hmm. is, is impacting on global diversity. Okay. Okay. So that's one area. And the second one I recently it intrigued me is the uh, pandemic mm-hmm. uh, spread of diseases and interna- uh, put it in the, in the lens of international communication. Mm-hmm. You know, how internet and social media are impacting on the, our understanding of the pandemic diseases. Okay. And, um, you know, YouTube recently banned any uh, uh, monetization of... Uh, of uh, the coronavirus. Oh, wow. And it, yeah, and, and and there was a huge outcry by the creators of social media content. So YouTube is now rethinking it, that ban. But, you know, when, when you monetize uh, social media content, um, and, and there's, a whole, there's a great deal of uh, risk of uh, manipulation of data and manipulation of our understanding of the pandemic diseases, mm-hmm. you know? And so... Uh, even the White House is now urging social media and high-tech people to be very cautious about misinformation regarding coronavirus. Mm-hmm. You know? So, so these are all the issues which I want to examine in my research. I know how pandemic diseases can be impacted by international media and international communication. That is fascinating. I mean, yeah. I could sit there and just listen to you talk about all of this and yeah. learn so much. Just like I did way back in the day. And Dr. Babley, I so appreciate you coming on this show. Absolutely. It's my great pleasure, Michelle. And you're on social media. You're not very active, but you do have handles. Where can people follow you? Um, I have a Facebook account. So just under my name, you know, Anantha Babley. Anantha Babley. You can go on. You're on Instagram too, but you're not on there that often. But you're Anantha Babley there as well. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And my... my, uh, Yahoo, I mean, email is also a very good way to reach me. Mm-hmm. Anantha S. Babili 
at yahoo.com. Awesome. Dr. Beverly, thanks for coming on. Next wow. time you're in Dallas, we've got to have dinner or lunch or coffee or something. Thank you so much. So greetings from Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi. And, you know, you take care you and uh, enjoy the spring break. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. And be cautious about, you know, the Oh, yeah. The whole- take care. <laughs> take okay. good yeah. care. The Culture Soup Podcast is a production of No Silos Communications.